Alright, we are on chapter 8. Roy stuck to his promise. He quit searching for Beatrice Leap's stepbrother, though it required all the willpower he could muster. One incentive to stay home was the weather. For three straight days, it stormed. According to the television news, a tropical wave had or stalled over southern Florida. Eight to twelve inches of precipitation was expected. Even if the sun had been shining gloriously, Roy wasn't going anywhere. The guy at the gas station reported that the punctured bicycle tire was beyond repair. You folks got a pet monkey? He'd asked Roy's father, because I swear it looks like teeth marks in the sidewall. Roy's parents didn't even ask Roy what had happened. Having lived in Montana, they were accustomed to dealing with flats. A new tire had been ordered, but in the meantime, Roy's bike sat idle in the garage. He spent the soggy afternoons working on homework projects and reading a cowboy novel. When he looked out the bedroom window, all he saw were puddles. He missed the mountains more than ever. Then, Roy's mother picked him up after class on Thursday, when she said, or she said she had some good news. Your suspension from the school bus has been lifted. Roy wasn't exactly ready to turn cartwheels. Why? What happened? I guess Miss Hennepin reconsidered the situation. How come? Did you call her or something? Actually, I've spoken to her a number of times, his mother acknowledged. It was a fairness issue, honey. It wasn't right that you got suspended while nothing happened to the boy who started the fight. It wasn't a fight, Mom. Regardless, it looks like Miss Hennepin came around to our point of view. Starting tomorrow morning, you're back on the bus. Yippee, Roy thought. Bun thanks a bunch, Mom. He suspected she'd never or she had another motive for pestering the vice principal. She was eager to resume her early morning yoga sessions at the community college, which she couldn't attend as long as she was driving Roy to Trace Middle. He didn't want to be selfish, though. He couldn't depend on his parents forever. Maybe the other kids on the bus wouldn't make too big a deal out of his return. What's the matter, honey? I thought you'd be glad to be back on your regular routine. I am, Mom. Tomorrow is a good day as any, Roy thought. Might as well get it over with. All right, we're jumping scenes. Leroy Brannett, the bald man who called himself Curly, was under too much pressure. His eyelids twitched from lack of sleep, and all day long he perspired like an Arkansas hog. Supervising a construction job was a large responsibility, and every morning brought new obstacles and headaches. Thanks to the mystery intruders, the Pancake House project already was two weeks behind schedule. Delays cost money, and the big shots at the Mother Paula's corporation weren't happy. Curly expected to be fired if anything else went wrong. He'd been told as much by a top-level executive of Mother Paula's. The man's job title was Vice President of Corporate Relations, and his name was Chuck Muckle, which Curly thought would be more suitable for a circus clown. Chuck Muckle wasn't a very jolly fellow, though, especially after seeing the newspaper article about the police car being spray-painted on Mother Paula's property. Among Chuck Muckle's responsibilities was to keep Mother Paula's valuable brand name out of the media, unless the company was opening a new franchise or introducing a new menu item, such as its sensational key lime flapjacks. In all his years of supervising construction, Curly had never gotten a phone call like the one he received from Chuck Muckle after the newspaper story appeared. He'd never before been chewed out for 15 minutes, non-stop by a company vice president. Hey, it ain't my fault, Curly had finally interjected. I ain't the one who fell asleep on the job. It was the cop. Chuck Muckle instructed him to quit whining and take it like a man. You're the foreman, aren't you, Mr. Brannett? Yeah, but... Well, you're going to be an unemployed foreman if anything like this happens again. Mother Paula's is a publicly traded company with a global reputation to protect. This is not the sort of attention that's beneficial to our image. Do you understand? I do, Curly had said, though he hadn't. Serious pancake eaters wouldn't care what happened to the police car, or even about the gators in the portable potties. By the time the restaurant opened, all that weird stuff would be forgotten. However, Chuck Muckle had been in no mood for a reasonable discussion. Listen closely, Mr. Brannett. This nonsense is going to stop. As soon as we hang up, you're going to go out and rent the biggest, most bloodthirsty attack dogs you can find. Rottweilers are the best, but Dobermans will do. Yes, sir. Is the site even cleared yet? It's raining, Curly had said. It's supposed to keep on raining all week. He figured Chuck Muckle would find a way to believe him for the weather, or blame him for the weather, too. Unbelievable, the vice president grumbled. No more delays, you hear me? No more. 
The plan was to get the site cleared before bringing in the VIPs and the media for the official gala groundbreaking ceremony. The highlight was going to be the special appearance by the woman who portrayed Mother Paula in the advertisements and TV spots. Her name was Kimberly Lou Dixon, a runner-up in the Miss America contest in either 1987 or 1988. Afterward, she became an actress, though Curly couldn't recall seeing her anywhere except in the Pancake House commercials. They dressed her up in a calico apron, a gray wig, and granny glasses to make her look like an old lady. Let me explain while well, you'll be out of a job if this project gets stalled again, Chuck Muckle said to Curly. Miss Dixon's window of availability is extremely limited. She's due to start filming a major motion picture in a couple of weeks. No kidding, what's it called? Curly and his wife were avid movie fans. Mutant invaders from Jupiter 7, said Chuck Muckle. The problem is, Mr. Brannett. If the groundbreaking gets postponed, Miss Kimberly Lou Dixon won't be able to attend. She'll be on her way to Las Crucas, New Mexico, preparing for her role as Queen of Mutant Grasshoppers. Wow, thought Curly, she's playing the queen. Without Miss Dixon's presence, we will no longer have a blockbuster event, publicity-wise. She's the company icon, Mr. Brannett. She's our Aunt Jemima, our Betty Crocker, our Tony the Tiger, said Curly. I'm glad you understand what's at stake here. I sure do, Mr. Muckle. Excellent. If everything goes smoothly, you and I will never need to speak to each other again. Won't that be nice? Yes, sir, Curly agreed. The first order of business was erecting the chain link fence around the construction site. Finding somebody to work in the rain wasn't easy, but Curly eventually hooked up with an outfit in Bonita Springs. Now the fence was finished, and it was only a matter of waiting for the guard dog trainer to arrive. Curly was somewhat nervous. He wasn't really a dog person. In fact, he and his wife had never owned a pet, unless you count the stray cat that occasionally slept under the back porch. The cat didn't even have a name, which was fine with Curly. He had enough to worry about with the humans in his life. At half past four, a red truck with a camper top drove up to the trailer. Curly pulled a yellow poncho over his glistening head and stepped out into the endless drizzle. The trainer was a beefy, mustached man who introduced himself as Kalo. He spoke with a foreign accent, the same accent that German soldiers always had in World War II movies. Curly could hear the dogs barking ferociously in the camper bed, heaving themselves against the truck's tailgate. Kalo said, You go home now, ya? Yeah? Curly glanced at his wristwatch and nodded. I lock up the fence. I come back tomorrow early to get the dogs. Fine by me, Curly said. Some things happens. You call right away. No touch the zogs, Callow warned. No talk to them, no feed them. Important, ya? Yeah? Oh, ya. Yeah. Curly was more than happy to steer clear of the brutes. He backed his pickup off the lot and got out to close the gate. Callow waved amiably when he turned the attack dogs loose. They were extremely large, all Rottweilers. They took off lopping around the fence, crashing through the puddles, when they got to the gate, all four of them leapt upright against the fence, snarling and snapping at Curly on the other side. Callow ran up, shouting commands in German. Instantly, the Rottweiler ceased barking and dropped to the sitting positions, their black ears pricking up intently. Maybe best you go now, Kalo said to Curly. They got names? Oh yeah, that one there is Max, that one, Claus, that one, Carl, and that big one is Pookie Face. Pookie face, Curly said, is my precious baby. I call, I brought him all the way from Munich. They'll be okay in the rain? Callow grinned. They be okay in hurricane. You go home now. Don't worry. The dogs, they take care of your problem. As he walked back to his truck, Curly saw the Rottweilers were watching every movie made. They were pa panting lightly and their muzzles were flecked with foamy spittle. Curly figured he finally might get a decent night's sleep. The vandals didn't stand a chance against 500 odd pounds of bad butt dog flesh. They have to be insane to jump the fence, Curly thought, totally out of their minds. The next morning, Roy's mother offered to drop him at the bus on her way to yoga class. Roy said no thanks. The rain had finally let up and he felt like walking. A fresh breeze was blowing in off the bay, and the tangy salt air tasted good. Seagulls circled overhead while two ospreys piped at each other in the nest on top of the concrete utility pole. On the ground at the base of the pole were bleached fragments of mullet skeletons that had been picked clean and discarded by the birds. 
Roy paused to study the fish bones. Then he stepped back and peered up at the ospreys, whose heads were barely visible over the scraggle of the nest. He could tell that one was larger than the other, a mother probably teaching her fledgling how to hunt. In Montana, ospreys lived in the cottonwoods all along the big rivers, where they dived on trout and whitefish. Roy had been pleasantly surprised to find that Florida had ospreys too. It was remarkable that the same species of bird was able to thrive in two places so far apart and so completely different. If they can do it, Roy thought, maybe I can too. He hung around watching the nest for so long that he almost missed the school bus. He had to jog to the last block to get there before it pulled away, and he was the last to board. The other kids grew strangely quiet as Roy made his way down the aisle. When he sat down, the girl in the window seat quickly stood up and moved to another row. Roy got a bad feeling, but he didn't want to turn around to see if he was right. He hunkered down and pretended to read his comic book. He heard kids whispering in the seat behind him, followed by a hasty gathering of books and backpacks. In a flash, they were gone, and Roy sensed a larger presence sulking. Hi, Dana, he said, twisting slowly in his seat. Hey, cowgirl. After a week, Dana Matherson's nose was still slightly purple and puffy, though it definitely wasn't protruding from the center of his forehead, as Garrett had claimed. The only thing startling about Dana's appearance was a fat, scabrous upper lip that hadn't been the way, been that way when Roy dropped off the letter at Dana's front door. Roy wondered if Dana's mother had popped him in the kisser. The new injury endowed a big, endowed the big oaf with a disconcerting lisp. You and me got some business to settle, Eberhart. What business, Roy said. I gave you an apology. That makes us even. Dana clamped a moist, ham-sized hand over Roy's face. We're a long way from even, you and me. Roy couldn't speak because his mouth was covered. Not that he had much to say. He glared out from between Dana's putty fingers, which reeked of cigarettes. You want to be thorry? You're going to be thorry you ever met with me. Dana growled. I'm going to be your worst nightmare. The school bus rolled to a sudden halt. Dana quickly let go of Roy's face and folded his hands primely in case the driver was looking in the mirror. Three kids from the Roy's grade got on the bus and upon spotting Dana, wisely scrambled for seats up front. As soon as the bus started moving, Dana again grabbed for Roy, who calmly slapped his arm away. Dana rocked back, staring at him in disbelief. You didn't even read the letter, Roy asked. Everything will be cool as long as you leave me alone. Did you just hit me? Did you hit my arm? So sue me, Roy said. Dana's eyes widened. What did you say? I say you need to get your hearing checked, partner, along with your IQ. Roy wasn't sure what possessed him to wise off to such a violent kid. He didn't particularly enjoy getting roughed up, but the alternative was to cower and beg, which he couldn't lower himself to do. Every time the Eberharts moved from one town to another, Roy encountered a whole new set of bullies and goons. He considered himself an expert on the breed. If he stood his ground, they usually backed down or looked for someone else to hassle. Insulting them, however, could be risky. Roy noticed a couple of Dana's meathead pals watching the scene from the back of the bus. That meant Dana would feel obligated to demonstrate what a tough hombre he was. Hit me, said Roy. What? Go ahead, get it out of your system. You're a nutcase, Eberhart. And you're dumb as a bucket of mud, Matherson. That one did the trick. Dana lunged across the seat and whacked Roy on the side of the head. After straightening himself, Roy said, There, feel better now? Dang right I do, Dana exclaimed. Good. Roy turned around and opened his comic book. Dana smacked him again. Roy toppled sideways on the seat. Dana laughed cruelly and shouted something to his buddies. Roy sat up right away. His head really hurt, but he didn't want anyone to know. Nonchalantly, he picked his comic book off the floor and placed it on his lap. This time, Dana hit him with the other hand, equally fat and damp. As Roy went down, he let out an involuntary cry, which was drowned by the loud, gaseous hissing of the bus brakes. For one hopeful moment, Roy thought the driver had seen what was happening and was pulling off the road to intervene. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case. The driver was oblivious to Dana's bad behavior as ever. The school bus had merely arrived at the next stop. While another line of kids boarded, Dana composed himself as if he were a model citizen. Roy looked down, fixing his eyes on the comic book. 
He knew the assault would resume as soon as the bus got rolling, and he braced grimly for Dana's next blow. But it never came. For blocks and blocks, Roy sat as rigid as a fence post, waiting to be knocked down once more. Finally, his curiosity got the best of him, and he peeked over his left shoulder. Roy could hardly believe it. Dana was slumped sourly against the window. The dumb goon's fun had been spoiled by one of the kids from the last bus stop, who had been brave enough to sit right next to him. What are you staring at? The newcomer snapped at Roy. Despite his pounding headache, Roy had to smile. Hi, Beatrice, he said. All right, so what do you think that ending to that chapter means? That's what I'd like to know today.